welcome you guys to uh, worship here at Living Word Fellowship, the first Sabbath in May. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, church. Um, today I was thinking of um, how much God does for us, really, in our lives. How much he um, fulfills our lives, how much meaning he gives to our lives, and how much he is just he is not only enough, but he is more than enough for us. I'd ask you to please join us in singing Draw Me Close. Sabbath, everybody. It's so, isn't it thrilling to know that we have Jesus in our lives? He really, truly makes a difference. And um, like, like we've just been singing, it's we've had we have so many reasons to be grateful to God. We we truly do. And um, two things that come to mind right now. Um, is God's grace and his guidance. He is, he's truly, um, like, for instance, I myself would not be here if it wasn't for God's grace and guidance. And one, one text that comes to mind is in Isaiah 42, verse 16 says, 
I will lead the blind by ways they have not known. Along a familiar paths, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness into light before them and make the rough places smooth. So, although we are we are still blinded by sin, we are we are all sinners. I know I am. We we have great comfort and hope in God's grace. So, as as I'm praying, I I invite you to just reflect on how God has been guiding you, graciously guiding you in your life. And just let's worship together. So please assume the position that you're inspired to worship in. I will kneel. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before your throne of mercy to worship you because you are an amazing God. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you, Lord, and we are so thankful for your, for your guidance in our lives, Lord. Um, you know where we've been through. We know how far we have come because of you, Lord. And as, as we have just listened uh, from Isaiah, Lord, we, we are still blind sinners, and we are so much in need of your grace, Lord. So that's why before uh, we come before you to ask you for your forgiveness, Lord, for everything um, that we have done that made you sad, for all the sins we committed, Lord, unwillingly, Lord, or even willingly, just please um, cover us with your blood and just cleanse us, Lord. Um, cover us and wrap us in your robes of righteousness. And also, Lord, uh, continue to transform us into uh, the beautiful, beautiful people that you have created us to be, Lord. Um, just please help us to s fix our eyes on you because uh, not by looking our, at ourselves, Lord, we would be lost, but by looking at you, we know that we have, we have so much hope and we know that we will be transformed as we look at you. Help us to depend completely on you. And we thank you, uh, Lord, in particular. We have so many reasons to be thankful for Mother's Day that is coming. We thank you for all of our moms that you have given us. We wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. You have um, used them, Lord, to, to bring us and to grow us into the people you want us to be. Lord, please bless them. Help them to be loved and help them to know that just how precious they are to us. And Lord, I pray that for your healing power, Lord, heal us spiritually, you know, help us to become more like you, cleanse us from our weaknesses, but also um, heal us physically, Lord. You know um, what we are struggling with, spiritually or physically, just restore us and make us whole in you. And Lord, we surrender everything, everything that's on our minds right now. Help us to just let go of it and be able to worship you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How are you guys doing today? Great, good, super. So not convincing, you guys. Anyway, I am happy to be here. And yes, it is offering time. And I was given an opportunity to present a ministry option, a, a ministry opportunity. Uh, for those of you who were here last semester, I gave a presentation about my trip to Madagascar last summer, and I have the opportunity to go back this summer. And this study tour to Madagascar is through the Community and International Development Department in uh, conjunction with the Social Work Department. And every summer we go, we pick out a couple communities where we can help, or we can try to help and develop and provide them means to um, better their lives. And so this summer we are going to Madagascar and we have several projects in mind. And one of them is to provide light to students. Now Madagascar is a country where the sun consistently sets between 5.30 and 6.30 every day. So if students finish school, 
they go home, they do chores. By the time they're done with their chores, the sun is down, it's dark, they can't do homework at, at home. They can't study, they can't do anything. And most of the rural places in Madagascar has zero electricity. So one of the things we are raising money to do is to provide a solar lamp. Now, how many of you have seen this before? So this is something, this is called a Lucy light. It is solar powered. It charges from one side and the charge will go for about 12 hours. The even cooler part is it inflates. Not only does it inflate, but it's actually waterproof. So you can actually, you know, drop in a water and it will still work. So the idea is to raise enough funds to purchase 60 of these. Uh, one lamp is actually about $15, but we have been in communication with the company that makes these, and we will be getting a 30% discount to purchase these. But this is just one of the projects that we're looking to do. We're also looking to provide sustainable livelihoods. So uh, work for single widowed women and their children. And that is in the form of a chicken farm, right? And so for $100, you can provide a long-term source of income for women in this village and their kids. Again, that's just two. There are several others. Unfortunately, I didn't have an opportunity to, to bring um, the flyers or even have something on screen. But as you give offering today, um, I just ask that you put in a little extra uh, so that we can help the people in Madagascar. And if you have any questions about the projects, feel free to talk to me. If you uh, want to, if you want like validity about what we're doing, like our one of our seminary pastor students, Mel. How many of you guys know Mel is from Madagascar? Not very many of you. Okay. Well, Mel is from Madagascar. Mel, can you say hi? Yeah. So there's Mel. So he can totally vouch, not just for what we're doing, but, um, you know, unfortunately, the situation in Madagascar, they are one of the poorest countries in the world. So any little bit will help. So I thank you for giving me this opportunity and time to um, share what's going to happen. And then I will happily report back to you when I return and hopefully have a lot of photos to share as well. Um, we have a special... I don't know, surprise, I guess, for all the parents. Um, the kids here from Living Word have prepared a poem for the mothers. So if I can ask all the children who came up to practice, please come on up. Come on up. Don't be scared. Come on up. Good, good. Stand here. Aren't they really good looking kids? They really are. They're really smart too. And they love Jesus. Okay. Remember, you guys have to be loud. Okay? My mother is so special. She means so much to me. She's patient, understanding, and as gentle as can be. She's lots of fun to be with, and she's always there for me. And that's why she's a great example of Jesus to me. Good job, good job. Okay, look, smile, smile. Wonderful. I know some mothers can't be here, but we have it recorded for those who can't. Um, so congrats. Good job, guys. Okay, now at the back, you see Miss Sophia over there? She has roses. Please go up, and if you have a mother here, grab a rose, and you can give it to your mom. That's okay. You can keep it for your mom. Come on. Okay, our scripture reading for this morning is found in Mark 1, verses 14 to 21. To 20. After John had been put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee and preached the good news from God. The, the right time has come, he said, and the kingdom of God is near. 
turn away from your sins and believe in the good news. As Jesus walked along the shore of Lake Galilee, he saw two fishermen, Simon and his brother Andrew, catching fish with a net. Jesus said to them, come with me and I will tell, teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. He went a little further on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat getting their nets ready. As soon as Jesus saw them, he called to them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired man and went with Jesus. So uh, before Pastor Gresford gives us his final sermon uh, uh, for us uh, today, um, I wanted to say a few words in appreciation for what uh, Pastor Gresford has done for us. Um, you know, I was trying to, you know, Pastor Elm asked me to say a few words, and I was happy to do it. I, I wasn't quite sure what to say, so I asked uh, my wife uh, the other night, I said, hey, you know, what, what could I say about Pastor Gresford to really show how much we appreciate him? You know, what, what kinds of things do you think about? And, and so her answer was, his name is Gresford. <laughs> That's all there is to say. Now, um, I figure it's, you know, that, so that got me thinking, you know, like, you have a very unique name. You probably have to have a good, strong character to deserve, deserve such a name. <laughs> and so I tried looking up the, ne the meaning of Gresford. Really? Yes. And nothing showed up. <laughs> all that showed up was the Gresford disaster. That's all that, th th there's some city in Great Britain yeah. called Gresford, and there was a disaster there many years ago. That's all I could find. I tried to look up the meaning, nothing. So I saw this. This is interesting. So th there's this, there's this uh, site about Gresford and, and kind of characteristics of people named Gresford. So I'm going to read some of these. And maybe not all apply to you. Some probably do, some probably don't. But just interesting things about what you could or couldn't be. We'll see. So your name, Gresford, gives you the ability to understand people and to merge conflicting viewpoints to create harmony in association. I like that. I think, I think not bad, huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, you dislike witnessing hurt feelings. Uh, uh, you make friends easily but must guard against becoming involved in the f affairs of others or being too easily led. Um, you, dislike, you dislike heavy manual work as well. You are inclined to put plans off until forced to take action. Uh, I don't think that applies to you. Um, without the encouragement of others, you lack the energy, confidence, or initiative to bring idea to fruition. That's interesting. This name creates weakness in the fluids of the body, kidneys, or glandular system. So, you know, I don't know what Gresford means. Uh, I don't know if you know. Um, but... Uh, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, you had to build, str you know, you have a strong character to have a name like Gresford. I don't know if, if you know, growing up, having a name like Gresford was, tough. it was tough. Yeah. Okay, tough. probably. Yeah. So this is sort of a, you know, this is all contributed to kind of who you are as a person. Um, we are so blessed that you made the sacrifice to accept God's calling uh, to the ministry we know you had, you know, you had per perhaps other things in mind uh, before you joined the ministry, but you uh, put that aside. You accepted God's calling. You came to our church, and we're so grateful for everything you've done and the way you've um, led in multiple different ways, with the media, um, you know, with the with those emails that you 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 sent. Um, you know, you really set the bar the bar high for us. Uh, I don't know that anyone will ever, will ever be able to fill your shoes, um, but uh, you've set the, bi the bar high and for us to shoot for, and so I want you to let you know that we're very blessed that uh, you are part of our church family. Um, we want to continue on with the legacy that you've started, so hopefully uh, when, you know, five years from now or ten years from now, when you look back on your time here and, uh, and, and you look at where we are, hopefully you can say, hey, you know, I contributed to some of that, and, and we just want to, with God's blessing, we want to build on, on what you started with us. 
Okay. Right. Um, and so as a small token of appreciation, uh, we wanted to give you a small gift uh, for you and your family. Elia, we're so blessed that you're with us also. I'm not quite sure if I was supposed to say something about Elia because she's still sort of here, yes. right? Uh, so, you know, I, my pet peeve is to say this big long goodbye and then just keep seeing her for the next, next couple of weeks. <laughs> so I know you're leaving. Well, maybe we'll do something special for Elia when she leaves, but sure. we want to say we really appreciate what you've done, and uh, we, we pray that God will continue to bless you in your ministry moving forward in California. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. All right. That was unexpected. Thank you, Brian, for uh, that presentation. Just in response to what Brian was saying and what I was going to say was just uh, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to serve here at Living Word Fellowship Church. Um, it was Pastor Ray who uh, left recently who uh, convinced me after a couple of years to come here and to serve. And my wife and I have had many discussions saying that we should have come at his first insistence that we come because we have really been blessed by the support that the uh, elders have shown us, by, the, by seeing the way that uh, the young people here have just gone into ministry and have done wonderful, beautiful things. The whole um, youth-led, lay-driven model is done well here, and it's something that I will keep in mind as I move forward in, in my ministry. So thank you, Brian. Thank you, all of the other elders who I, who I see. You, you know who you are for the opportunity to uh, serve here, and I look forward to looking back on my time very fondly here at Living Word Fellowship as we move uh, forward with that. The title of my message today is He Saw. Stories told of a, an accomplished violinist. He was playing for his final concert. And as the word went out that this would be the final time that this man would be playing, another important fact was added to the concert agenda. He would be playing on a violin worth $2.5 million. Many bought tickets in great anticipation. Not only did they want to hear this, this violinist play, this, this maestro play, this very last time, but they wanted to experience the unique and melodious sound that would emit from such an instrument. The violinist went on stage one final time, and he delivered a performance for the ages. It was a masterful performance. His performance brought tears to the eyes of those in the audience, and, and they felt honored and privileged to have been there to experience this unique event. At the end of the performance, as you can imagine, he received a standing ovation. The people wanted more, so he complied. And what he did is he promptly threw this priceless instrument to the ground, and he started stomping on it. The applause came to an abrupt end. What was he doing? The people were aghast that, that he would crush this priceless tool into pieces. After he had finished destroying the violin, he walked off the stage. Silence filled the hall. Had he just destroyed, had he really, truly just destroyed this instrument, this one-of-a-kind violin? Surely he could have passed it down to another budding musician who was coming up rather than destroy it. What a waste. Immediately, the stage manager, the manager of the theater, he came out and he told them what had really happened. The violinist did not use this antique instrument. Instead, he played using a $75 knockoff. Now he would play using the violin worth an estimated $2.5 million. And play he did. He played that instrument with gusto. He played with the same grace and, and flawless sound that the people heard from the cheap knockoff. Now, perhaps to the, to the trained and focused ear, one was able to tell the difference, but few people could distinguish the quality of the sound from the $2.5 million violin and the $75 violin. Friends, the violinist wanted to show in his final performance 
as a final lesson to the people. In this final show of his career, he wanted them to know that it was the violinist and not the violin that makes the music. Jeremiah, the 18th chapter, a prophet, he was, get, he was told to go out and seek a maker of pottery. It was at this place that, that God was to give him an important word from the people. I'd like to invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to Jeremiah, the 18th chapter. We're going to take a look at Jeremiah rather quickly, then we're going to move into our main message. Jeremiah 18, verses 3 through 6. Jeremiah 18, verses 3 through 6. I'm reading from the English Standard Version, and here it says in Jeremiah 18, 3 through 6, Jeremiah is speaking here, and he says, So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel, and the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hand, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand. As I was preparing this message, I was tempted to stop right here, friends. Because you see, just as the violinist was able to make beautiful music from that cheap violin, God is able to do miraculous and fantastic things through these broken vessels of who we are. What we do for the kingdom of Christ has little to do with who we are, but it has everything to do with the master creator. He could create a wonderful vessel. He could create beautiful music from cheap knockoffs. Our talents and, and our abilities may be noteworthy. Perhaps there's, perhaps there's wonderful things that, that we can do, but it's never worthy enough to be used for the purposes of the kingdom of heaven. But when he saw this, when, when Jesus saw this, he already knew what he had to offer was enough if we allowed ourselves to be molded and played in such a way that the world will, would be moved to be part of the kingdom of God. We're going to move into the book of Mark, and we're going to take a look at this concept a little further. But before we do, let us bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are thankful, so thankful today to have the opportunity once again to gather together, to open up your word, to read, to study, to be moved by not my words, but by your spirit. Father, I pray that as I speak, that it is not me who is speaking, but it is you speaking through me. Because, Lord, you know I'm, I, I, I babble. I have, I have nothing of worth to say. But, Father, I, I pray that you would use me for your honor and glory, and that we would leave here knowing that we have been in your presence and have heard your word. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Mark, Mark the first chapter. We're going to be looking at verse 14 and 15 first, and then we're going to phase into verses 16 through 20, to understand the concept of our title today, He Saw. The Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter, Mark 1, verses 14 and 15. Mark 1, 14 and 15. Mark 1, 14 and 15. This is what it says. Thank you, Flossie, for reading it this morning, this afternoon, I should say. Mark 1, 14 and 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. I've taken a personal interest in the gospel according to Mark. I've come to appreciate the way that Mark presents the gospel message. One thing we see in the book of Mark is, is that the events move rather quickly. The word uh, that's translated immediately is used rather uh, extensively within the book of Mark because he goes from one event, event to the next event just to show what's happening in the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. And, and his purpose is to show what Jesus is doing. 
Though the authorship is, is not claimed here in the pages of this book, the early church uh, fathers and, and authors are in full agreement that it was John Mark who wrote this book. Mark, he worked closely with Peter, the apostle Peter, just before his death in Rome. So some scholars view this book as, as Peter's memories set forth by Mark under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Mark and Peter were working very closely, and, and uh, uh, Peter was giving Mark information about what was happening and going on in the, in the ministry of, of Jesus Christ. Now, a careful read of this book shows that its purpose is not historical, to show some history. It's not biographical, but it's practical. It's to show how we should live as Christians. And we have just a little time, and we're going to take a look at just a little portion, these little four verses, and see what, what our Mark is showing us. Now, this is important, because we can see this from the beginning of the book. Now, I started in verse 14, but, and one thing we see is that it talks about John the Baptist. John the Baptist, the one who foretold of someone greater than uh, himself coming, he is now out of the picture. It says that he was arrested. He is now out of the picture. His work is now complete, preparing the way of Jesus. And now it's time for Jesus to come and to show and, and to come with his unique message of hope. The first thing he says as he comes on the scene is the time is fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. Now the idea presented in these Four words. It's very powerful, friends. What it refers to is a, is a definite point in, in time appointed by God for the fulfillment of his promises. Now, this is a concept I could personally relate to. I see Trey in the audience. He can relate to this, too. Last week, I had the opportunity to graduate from the seminary. As I stood in line waiting to enter the Pioneer Memorial Church to, to receive my... Uh, empty diploma cover. I haven't gotten the diploma yet. <laughs> and to receive a, a handshake from uh, Dr. Andreasen, these words came to mind. The time is fulfilled. It had been three years of written exams, three years of, of multiple choice tests, three years of reaction papers, three years of exegesis papers, of lectures, conducting evangelistic series, serving in churches as a student pastor, studying biblical language, and praying that God would just get me through one more class so that I could finish and, and, be, and survive to see another semester. It had been three years of late night studying and wondering how I was supposed to read 300 pages in two days. It had been... Three years of checking classes off of my master seminary class list and meeting with my advisor, wondering when it's going to be that I finish this place and, and wondering if I had missed a class and wondering if it was going to come back and bite me at the end. Three years of, of hoping that I had attended enough chapels to graduate. But at last, at last, I stood in line. The time was fulfilled. I could finally look forward to graduating, completing the challenge of seminary. I finally could look forward and know that that time had come to fruition and it was time to receive my reward. Now, friends, when the Jews heard these words from Jesus Christ, the time was fulfilled. They were going through much worse than I could ever imagine going through in my seminary experience. Mark in the book of Mark, as we were looking at these words, they, they had gone through Roman persecution. And then the Gentiles who were reading this were going through persecution of themselves. Nero was in power. And they needed a word of hope. They needed to know that the time was fulfilled. Perhaps, friends, as we look at this, these four words, perhaps you're going through a, a time of hardship in your life. Perhaps there's, there's something that, that is happening in your experience right now, and you're wondering, will the time ever be fulfilled? Will it ever come to an end? Perhaps it's, it's uh, the death of a, a loved one that still stings. Perhaps it's a di the diagnosis from a doctor where there seems to be no hope for your condition. 
Maybe it's a class that you keep dropping because you can't seem to grasp the concepts, but you need that class for graduation. Friends, if that's your story, friends, if you're in a state of despair and, and, and hopelessness, hope has arrived. Jesus is on the scene. The time is fulfilled. The message that he has will change your circumstances. So what is that message? What is that message? The crux of the message is simple. The kingdom, the kingdom of God is here. This is something that we, we see in New Testament scripture, specifically in the Gospels, over and over again. Talk of the kingdom of God and what that is. The reason is that this concept of the kingdom, this concept of the kingdom of God is, is one that resonated in the heart of every Jew and every church believer in the, in the early times there. The kingdom of God is, is simply the concept of God himself taking control of the world, that he is now the one who is in charge. It's not Caesar, it's not Nero, it's not Obama or whoever, it is God who's taking control. And, and the result would be that his will would be done over all of the earth. The kingdom of God represents a new time. It represents new circumstances in life. But friends, you see, the problem was with, with their understanding, with their concept of the kingdom, that, that they were still looking at their trials and, and issues, and they were looking at it from a physical perspective, a very physical, external perspective. They were looking for a physical, external kingdom to come and crush all of the things that were going on in their life in order to bring peace and prosperity. The idea of spiritual peace the idea of spiritual prosperity was, was something that was secondary to them. What they wanted was a peace that could be seen physically and, and experienced physically also. They wanted something in the here and now. But here we find in the book of Mark that Jesus is about to define the true meaning of his kingdom, the true meaning of the kingdom of God. His life, his ministry, his example, his teachings were about to blow all of these misconceptions out of the water. Now, friends, part of the understanding of the, the nearness of the kingdom is to understand its nature. The kingdom, as he says right here, he says to repent and believe the gospel. This is the nature of the kingdom. It's about repentance, and it's about belief. Now, a call to repentance, which simply means to turn around from the direction you were going to, is one of the most difficult ones to heed. We probably have heard that word a million times, but do we truly repent? You know, I was tickled when I, when I um, read this uh, uh, satirical take on an old prayer from a Christian lexicon, but at the same time as I was reading this, I, I, I shuddered because I realized that I think these thoughts at times. Here, let me read it for you. I'm, I'm reading directly of what it says. It says, benevolent an easygoing father. We have occasionally been guilty of errors in judgment. We have lived under the deprivations of heredity and the disadvantages of environment. We have sometimes failed to act in accordance with common sense. We have done the best we could in the circumstances and have been careful not to ignore the common standards of decency. And we are glad to think that, that we are fairly normal. Do thou, O Lord, deal lightly with our infrequent lapses. Be thy own sweet self with those who admit they are not perfect, according to the unlimited tolerances which we have a right to expect from thee. And grant us as an indulgent parent that we may hereafter continue to live a harmless and happy life and keep our self-respect. Amen. Sounds like a good plan. Forgive me, God. I'm only human. I make mistakes. I'm, in fact, I'm, I'm supposed to make mistakes. But repentance says something different. Repentance says, God, equip me by the power of your spirit to turn away from the sins that are overtaking me that, that are both serious 
and, and deadly, and allow me, Lord, to surrender totally to you. And then help me to turn to belief to the good news that can only be found in the life of and teachings and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because this is where the next four verses come in, because what I found is repentance and belief is something that we can all come to. We can all repent and we can all believe, but if the next four verses of what Jesus did in the next four verses is not something that happens within our lives, then repentance and belief is something that we just continue to recycle over and over again, and we find ourselves not going anywhere in our Christian experience. Let's take a look at verses 16 through 20. Mark 1, verses 16 through 20, and this is what happens. The familiar words, as I mentioned earlier, and immediately, um, 16, passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately... They left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately, there it is again, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. The title of my sermon was taken from the two words we see in verse 16. And we also see it again in verse 19. He saw. Before we look at what he saw, let's examine what we see or what I saw as I was looking at this. I see two sets of brothers. I see Peter and I see Andrew. These are poor, smelly, foul-mouthed fishermen trying to make it. They're passing along on the, Jesus passed them along on the seashore, which which shows that they were not ones that had means. There were two different ways that you could fish. You could take a net and stand at the seashore and throw it out. You didn't have a boat. Or like James and John, if you had a boat, you could drop it from the side of the boat, and that was a little more lucrative because you can get out deeper and get more fish. But we see Peter and Andrew, these, these poor Smelly, foul-mouthed fishermen trying to make it. And, and we see the way that they were fishing. In Peter, we see a man who is ready to talk himself up. And as we see, as we look in the, the Gospels, he's, he's a man who's, who's ready to speak before he listens. He's ready to, to curse at the drop of a hat. In James and John, we don't see much difference. We see two, maybe a little richer individuals, Two rich boys, if you will. They were fishing from a boat, and they work with their father. They had a future. They had something to look forward to. They had a business going on, a business to run, a business to maintain, a business to make profitable. I see two brothers taking this time to, and, and, their desire, and having a desire for fame and having this, this thing in mind that they want to be the, the first. They want to be on top. Remember, through their mother, they asked to sit on the right and the left-hand side of Jesus Christ in the coming kingdom. This was their mindset. This was their mentality. They wanted to be first. They, they wanted to have it all. That's what I see. But what did Jesus see? He saw four men who had great potential to be molded, great potential to be shaped into mighty preachers for the gospel. And we see that in the book of Acts. He saw foul-mouthed Peter changed into a pillar of leadership under the new reign of God. He saw John, also a a crass-mouthed fisherman, become one of the most loving and caring people in the early church. Read the epistles that he wrote. You see nothing but love that he's expressing there. He saw James, one who was known for his anger, become one of the first to surrender his life for the cause of the gospel. It's interesting. This is how Ellen G. White puts it in her book, Education. This is interesting. Listen to this. In every human being, he discerned infinite possibilities. He saw men as they might 
be, transfigured by his grace in the beauty of the Lord our God. Looking upon them with hope, he inspired hope. Meeting them with confidence, he inspired trust. Revealing in himself man's true ideal, he awakened for its attainment both desire and faith. Friends, those two words, he saw, contains a wonderful and, and powerful message. Jesus saw that what other people don't see, but he also saw what we see. The only difference is he was able to look beyond. While those passing by on the seashore that day or any other day walked by and they saw those smelly fishermen doing their job, Jesus saw men washed by his transforming grace into powerful and skillful participants in the cause of the kingdom. He saw them working for the expansion of the kingdom of God. Friends, when Jesus looks at us, when Jesus looks at us, he doesn't see what the world sees. He doesn't even see what you see. He doesn't see what our friends see. Friends, he doesn't even see what our parents see. Some say you have a face only a mother can love. Jesus sees beyond that. Jesus sees us beyond what we are. Even though others may look at you and see some potential, Jesus sees what you are destined to be. He sees the result of repenting. He sees the result of believing. He sees the power of the Holy Spirit working in your life before that work has even begun. He sees the infinite possibilities of what you can be as you take time to surrender to him. He sees the infinite possibilities of, of your talents, of your abilities, of your desires, of, of everything that you uniquely have to offer. He sees those things as you enter into his kingdom, and he uses them for his honor and glory. So Jesus saw these things, and it led him to utter two more words. We read in verse 16, it says, And Jesus said to them, what did he say, friends? What did he say in verse 16? He says, verse 16, verse 17, follow me, small text, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Friends, this, this, this summons to follow cannot be seen in a vacuum. What Jesus saw were, were men who had been touched by the ministry of his, of his cousin, John the Baptist. What Jesus saw was men who had gone through the process of knowing, growing, and, and maturing this had taken place prior to this call to follow him. They had seen the works of Jesus. They had seen what he had done and, and what he was about. And this call to follow him was simply part of a developing relationship. This was the next step. When it says that the book of Mark is about practical, the practical nature of Christianity, this is what we're talking about. As we talk about entrance into the kingdom of God, we talk about repenting. We talk about believing, then we talk about following. That is a process of discipleship. It is a relationship that continually develops. Friends, one final thought. It centers on that process, that concept of discipleship. He called them to follow him, but there was something else. He called them to service. He says, right now you're, you're fishing. You're fishing for fish. But you're going to serve me now. You're going to be fishing for men. You're going to make something of them. Instead of catching fish, they would catch men. There were, but friends, there was a cost to this command because in order to catch men, they had to leave their fishing profession. They had to leave behind what was there. In order to do something new, they had to leave the familiar and the comfortable. What was comfortable to them, they, they had to leave in order to follow Jesus Christ. And this is the calling of every disciple, catching men and women. But you may say, I'm not a teacher like Dr. Arlen. I'm not a preacher like Pastor, like Pastor Um. How's God going to do that? How's God going to use me as, as a fisher of men? How is he going to transform me? Friends, when we come to Jesus, 
He uses our natural talents and abilities for his purposes. Nothing that we have gained, whether in school or, or socially, nothing that we have gained will be lost. Nothing that we have learned will be discarded. Every disciple has something that can build for the kingdom of God. I'm reminded of when I went out to field school last fall. I went out to field school in uh, San Jose, California. And I was put in a church where we were told that there was going to be work done prior. That there was going to be flyers sent out and all of these things were going to happen. And, and it never happened. But, but, what, but something did happen. Something did happen where I saw the power of God working. And that was during the time I was there, during the meetings that I, I gave, there, there were four baptisms. And every one of those baptisms had been preceded by a disciple, not, not one preaching like I was preaching, not even one teaching, but a disciple working with those individuals. I think of a lady that was there. She was a firecracker for God. She went out and she worked in a, in a daycare. And she had a, a co-worker who was, who was there working with her, who was having problems, and she would sit with her. She would counsel her. She would joke with her. She would, she would take her out to dinner. She would do so many things with her. She, she developed not only a working relationship, but a close friendship. Friends, do you know, she came to those meetings. She sat through those meetings, and there was her friend sitting by her side. And I tell you something, friends, it had nothing to do with my preaching. It had to do with that disciple that God was using there in that church for his honor and glory to expand the kingdom. What I did was just surface, friends. So every one of us, every one of us has an opportunity to be used by God for his honor and glory. Friends, Jesus sees. He saw you from the time you were born. He saw what, what you will be now. He saw what you will be in the next 10 years, in the next 15 years. He knows what you will do and what you will be for his honor and glory. So I ask you, friends, as you think about your life and your heart and your ways in, in, in following Jesus Christ, that you will use your abilities for his honor and glory and allow him to move you for his benefit. May God bless you. Father, we are so thankful for the assurance that you lead us, that you see us, that you see us in a way that no one else can see us, and you lead us in ways that will allow us to be used for your benefit. Fathers, we leave this place. May it be in our minds and our hearts to draw closer to you as you desire to draw closer to us. And may we make it our aim to let you lead in every aspect of our lives. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, the one who is able to present you faultless before the throne in the presence of his glory. To the only wise God be glory, be majesty, be dominion, and be power, both now and forever. In Jesus' name, let Living Word Fellowship say, Amen. Amen.